morning, everyone. Uh, during this uh, retreat, we have been studying this book, Opening the Hand of Thought. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk on the section entitled The Four Seals, page six. This is a part of the uh, uh, section one, Practice and Passions. Last two days I talked about passions, and yesterday I talked on the <coughs> significance of practice, not thinking. So now he, I mean Uchiyama Roshi, my teacher, starts to talk on the very basic and also essential teaching of Buddhism using the four seals. And at the end of yesterday's uh, lecture, I sh briefly introduced my understanding of those four uh, Dharma seals. <coughs> so those four, uh, excuse me. First one is uh, everything is suffering. Second is uh, everything is impermanence, impermanent. And third is uh, egoless or uh, non substance, no uh, substance or anatoman. And the fourth, that is the fourth. Nirvana. <laughs> Nirvana is uh, a tranquility or <coughs> what is the word? I forget. Anyway, uh, so now he is going to introduce very basic teaching of Buddhism using the, those four points. Uh, let me read and talk paragraph by paragraph. To page six. To begin with, there are two kinds of reality within our lives as human beings. One is the reality of chance or accident. The other is a reality having an absolute or undeniable nature. For example, perhaps I pour myself a cup of tea. I don't have to be pouring tea for myself. It's an accidental reality. There is no absolute reason why I have to be sitting here having tea. I just happen to be doing so. Seeing things in that way, most of our life consists of accidental realities. Things could be taking place another way. So now he starts to started to talk on two kinds of reality or truth. Uh, when we read Uchiyamuroshi's writing, it's a kind of a difficult, there is a difficulty. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, he, he was a uh, philosopher. He was a philosopher until he was 29, became a Buddhist monk. So he's basic way of thinking is uh, Western philosophy. And his ba basic vocabulary uh, well, also philosoph philosophy, Western philosophy. Uh, and he stud also studied uh, Christianity, uh, Catholic theology, and Buddhist philosophy also. 
uh, and he started to really practice uh, Zen uh, when he was 29. And he tried to explain the teaching and practice of Zen uh, using a kind of understandable expressions for uh, Westerners in this book and also for younger Japanese who, don't, who are not so familiar with Buddhist way of thinking and expressions. So it's very helpful for us to understand what uh, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist teaching or Zen teaching <coughs> really means. But there's one difficulty to read Uchamaroshi's that is, you know, the way Japanese philosophers write is very difficult mm. because they use, uh, uh, you know, all uh, philosophical terms in used in Japan among Japanese philosophers are all translations of the European, you know, Western philosophies. Mm. So uh, all of Almost all of the essential, uh, important terms, philosophical terms, are not familiar with common Japanese. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's like a, you know Buddhist terms for Western people. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you know, un until he became a Buddhist monk, you know, he wrote the philosophers wrote. That means his writing was very difficult, very conceptual and logical. And it's really difficult to write uh, uh, conceptual and logical uh, way of thinking in Japan using Japanese language. Okay. You know, Japanese language is not logical at all. We can write a sentence without subject. So, you know, but we can see because uh, through the context, we can see what is the subject. But without uh, understanding the context, you know, we don't really understand you know, what is, who is saying this and what is about this. So Japanese uh, philosophical writings are very difficult to read. You know, not only philosophical, uh, writings, but for example, a manual of you know computer. <laughs> for Japanese language, that kind of you know writings, which you know one word only has one meaning, and uh, each and every sentence should have subject and object. Uh, when we write in that way in Japanese very bad Japanese, <laughs> at least very uh, difficult to understand. Uh, but, that, but when he was young, that was his style of writing. And after he, he became a Buddhist monk, and he tried to uh, express or explain Buddhist teaching or about Zen practice, uh, he found that no one really read his writings until it is understandable. <laughs> because, you know, uh, if he was a, a professor at a university and had authority, then some p students or philosophers may read even, uh, it's very difficult to understand. But common Japanese never read such a difficult writings. So he tried to write in very understandable uh, uh, way. That means without using any philosophical or Buddhist techni technical terms. So when we read uh, what he's writing, we think it's, it's easy to understand. And uh, we thought, we think, you know, now I understand this. But uh, <clears throat> what he is trying to uh, express or explain is much more deeper than we understand. 
tipa o a broda o a more, <coughs> uh, how can I say, complicated, complicated yeah. When he talks about you know Buddhist teachings, you know even though he didn't he doesn't use the Buddhist Buddhist technical terms, I understand what he's talking about, and I can translate his you know common uh, expre- his uh, expression using common Japanese language into kind of a Buddhist terms. But I cannot, uh, when he, you know, talks based on the Western philosophy, because my basic, uh, you know, uh, vocabulary is uh, Buddhism. I didn't, you know, study Western philosophy. So when I sometimes I have I have difficulty to understand what Ochamrush is talking about, and I think this is one of the examples. He started to talk about two kind of reality or truth, and this two truth is not Buddhist two truth. You know, Buddhist two truth are you know mentioned or discussed by Nagarjuna, absolute truth and conventional or relative truth. But these two truths are, I think, from Western philosophy. And I try to understand these two truths in Western philosophy. And I started to read a dictionary of philosophy, both in Japanese <laughs> and English, yesterday. And I gave it up. I could, <laughs> you know, the dictionary, ha- the dictionary dis- explain using seven pages. It's a big book. And it starts from Aristotle to Wittgenstein. <laughs> Please. Uh, I was just going to ask about this particular description of the four seals. It doesn't seem to be the same as in as the earlier. Really? Yeah. The earlier um, edition. At least I don't see it yet. So I was wondering, is that Uchiyama's words, or is that somebody else? Uh, which, which one? The one you're holding. Those the four seals? Yeah, I mean, his explanation of accidents and so forth. Mm-hmm. Those are his terms. It's, yeah. Is it different in that version? Well, yes, on page 23, I have the older version. Mm-hmm. And C- can I see that? <laughs> well, yeah. well there, it's, it's not... Mm-hmm. Actually, he uses the words, but he introduced it a little differently. But he, it's, uh, maybe it's basically the same. There's this part about accidents, but his introduction is over here. Yeah, this is uh, changed by Jisho. Oh. The, uh, you know, this section, the four seals uh, in this version start... Uh, I start page 19. Yeah, it has a different feeling. Uh, it said, the paragraph starting, anyway, after 40 years, uh, page 19, I finally feel I can give a much clearer definition of truth. 40 years now, in going into the definition of truth, there are two kinds of reality within our lives as human beings. So the section of the four series in this version start from page 19. And he is saying the same thing. Uh, one is the reality of chance or accident. The other is a reality having an absolute or undeniable nature. So she changed the what do you call it? order or the place to uh, uh, start a new section. I'm sorry. 
It's not my fault. <laughs> this show did. Those four, two truths in Western philosophy is, uh, uh, in this translation, uh, probably this was, uh, you know, uh, originally uh, Uchamuro gave a, a talk in Japanese. And I don't think Tom Wright transcribed in Japanese, but he directly translated into English from uh, his talk, uh, listening the tape. So there's no Japanese original. But I'm pretty sure he, Uchamuro didn't use a philosophical terms, but he used a, a common Japanese or colloquial Japanese. So maybe Tom Wright didn't uh, think the, these are a, a philosophical term. But as a philosophy, uh, Western philosophical term, this uh, one is a reality of chance or accident is, I, I think, which I'm mostly referred to, a contingent truth, contingent truth and a necessary truth. This is the English word I found in the dictionary. So there are two truths. Uh, one dictionary quote from uh, Leibniz. Do you know? Do you, are you familiar with Leibniz, a, a German philosopher? Yeah. Uh, he, this person lived uh, from 1646 to 1716. So uh, he lived in the 17th century. And he said there are two kind of truths. Uh, a contingent truth and a necess necessary truth. Or another word is truth of reason and truth of fact. Truth of reason. Reason. <coughs> and tr truth and fact. Uh, and Leibniz said, truth of reason uh, is a necessary reason, or it's a necessity, that means it should be always that way. And a truth of fact may occur, maybe not occur depending upon the causes and conditions. That is a, a contingent truth, or truth of fact. And another is a necessary truth, or truth of reason. Uh, the difference between these two is uh, the first one, the truth of reason, is that must occur. That must occur. And in the case of truth of fact, that may or may not occur. So fact is necessary and fact is merely possible, possibility. That is fact which Amrosh is talking. Or the dictionary also said, necessary truth have generally been taken to be unconditional. So this is unconditional truth. It not depend on uh, other factors. This it should be always unconditionally true. And they are universally and unconditionally true, and thus do not depend, up, depend upon any argument for their justification. So we don't need to discuss if it, this is true or not. But other, another the truth of fact you know, can be discussed or can, should be justified if it's true or not. 
So this is these two truths, Dogen, not Dogen, but which Amaroshi is discussing here, is about these two truths, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> if you are familiar with Western philosophy, please let me know. Please. Could you give an example of those two? Uh, he's he's oh. giving uh, examples, okay. you know. Uh, for example, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps I pour myself a cup of tea. He's pouring tea. When he talks with people, he always makes tea and serves to people because he, he, you know, he was really good at making tea. He, the tea he made and tea f <laughs> we made are different. <laughs> He has a certain way of making tea. The tem temperature of the water is a key, and how long it should be in the tea kettle or teapot is also very important, makes very different taste. So when we visit uh, Uchamuroshi, he makes tea by himself. So he, when he discussed talk with people, he was always making tea. That <coughs> you know, he is talking about making a tea here. So he is pouring a tea from a tea pot to uh, his cup and he also serve you know the visitors. You know, this kind of thing. And he actually did it while he was doing it. So it's true. It's not uh, false, but uh, he said, I don't have to be pouring tea for myself. You know, usually disciples make tea for the teacher. <laughs> so, but that was his style, making tea and serve tea even to his disciples. Uh, uh, so I don't have to be pouring tea for myself. It's an accidental reality. That his choice. You know, he can make. He made choice. You know, he make tea because he make better tea than others. But it can be in other way. If he uh, visits some temple, then I don't think he asked the temple priest to make to let him make tea by himself, <laughs> but he just received the tea he was served. So I, either way is possible. There's no absolute reason he should in this way or that way, it, depending upon the situation or condition. And uh, the reality of chance or accident uh, is this kind of reality. We can make choice. What, uh, depending upon condition or situation, things may happen in different ways. Uh, so there is no absolute reason why I have to be sitting here having tea. I just happen to be doing so. Seeing things in that way, he said, most of our life consist of accidental realities. Almost everything we do is accident or contingent. That means it can be in another way. So things could be taking place another way. So almost all our activities are not uh, really absolute, uh, based on absolute reason, but it can be, you know, in different ways. This is one reality. <clears throat> and in the next con uh, paragraph, this is not to say there are no absolute realities. There are indeed some undeniable realities. For example, all living things die. There are no exceptions, no matter how much one is opposed to it or resist it, everything dies. 
this is an inescapable reality. So, unlike the accidental realities that just happen to come about, that should be changed by intention or design. There are undeniable realities that occur no matter how much we may resist them. So this is another one of the examples of undeniable or absolute reality that is all living beings must die. So he said there are two kinds of truths. And the, the, point, uh, the point is the Buddhist teachings is based on those not the, uh, uh, yeah, those absol absolute or undeniable realities, not uh, you know accidental or contingent reality or truth that may, might be different in within time or space or places. You know, something can be true in Japan, but cannot be true in America. Something uh, can be true or right in China, but not in France, and some, something which could be true uh, in you know, 20th century is not uh, true anymore in 21st century. So uh, accidental or contingent truths can be deferred or can be changed, or it uh, can be true at certain time and uh, place. But there is another kind of reality or truth that is always true. And according to Dogen, not Dogen, Uchiyamuroshi's point is Buddhist teaching, Buddha's teaching is based on those undeniable truths. In forever and forever, it is true. Uh, next paragraph. Any real or absolute truth must consist of living out our lives in accord with the inescapable realities that come about, no matter how much we may oppose them. Buddhism as a religious teaching is founded precisely upon this kind of truth. And he, he want to say, you know, this, these four Dharma seeds, four points are all undeniable or absolute uh, truth. Uh, during the period, period when trade between India and Greece and Rome was flourishing, Around, uh, around the time of Christ, so about 2,000 years ago, when Mahayana Buddhism was de developing, expressions and explanations concerning Shakyamuni's attitude and way of life became highly refined. Then, out of this, the true uniqueness of Buddhism developed. This uniqueness is embodied in the four seals or principles that she ho in in Japanese. Sometimes only the first three seals are mentioned, in which case they are known as a sambo in. These four seals more or less summarize Buddhism. Uh, Uchiyamuroshi is saying, you know, this Mahayana teaching was developed uh, <clears throat> when, you know, Buddhism from India encounter with uh, European way of thinking from Greece or Rome. Uh, many scholars uh, today think so. There's, uh, 
lot of communication or exchange between uh, India and uh, uh, not only Europe, but Greece, Rome, uh, Alexandria in Egypt, and Mi Middle East, and uh, uh, Arabic countries. There are much more uh, exchange and communication uh, around the time of uh, Christ, that is, uh, of course, the first, around the first century CE. Uh, and that was the time uh, Mahayana Buddhism, you know, aroused. And uh, it was, it is really true, you know, Buddhism was influenced by some Western or European uh, culture. You know, very important example is Buddha statues. You know, uh, until, you know, Greece, Greek, came to India with you know Alexander the Great. Uh, I think that was third century before BCE, third or fourth, maybe third. And uh, when uh, Alexander the Great came to India, uh, the Indian king who fought against. Uh, uh, the Greek invaders were, uh, his name was Chandra Gupta, the king Chandra Gupta. He was the uh, grandfather of King Ashoka. King Ashoka was the king or, or emperor of, of who united almost entire India. Until then, India was divided into several countries. Or nations. So, uh, at least uh, f since uh, third century BCE, before Christ, uh, there's a you know exchange and communication between uh, Greece and India. And recently, I read a news from China that from in the grave of the first emperor of China who built or constructed the uh, Great Wall, Long Wall, Great Wall. Great Wall. Uh, Chinese scholars found a bone of uh, Europeans. I think that was also uh, third century. BCE. So even to China, I think through the Silk Road, there's a, you know, uh, exchange and communication. Oh, and Buddha statues. Uh, so until after Alexander the Great came to India, but he returned soon, but his uh, retainers, what's the word, his people who came from, from with, with uh, Alexander the Great stayed in India and uh, uh, found their own kingdom. So there are some uh, area uh, governed by Greek uh, kings. And, uh, you know, until around that time, Indian Buddhists never made uh, Buddha statues or images. Uh, before that, uh, of course, there are, you know, Buddhist arts, but fear uh, uh, that Buddha should be, instead of the uh, form of uh, Buddha as a human, with human body, they he made uh, or write uh, or paint the Dharma wheel, Dharma wheel or Buddha's feet. Mm -hmm. That means Indian Buddhists think Buddha was a human being. 
So it should not be expressed using human form. But I uh, think uh, Greek, Greek people came to India and st started living in India. Those people start, started to make uh, statues of Buddha uh, at uh, a few places in India, such as Gandhara and uh, Matsura. So, you know, very early Buddha statues looks like uh, European. You know, Buddha has uh, hairs. Anyway, that is one example of, you know, uh, influence from uh, Greek or Europe to Buddhism. And some scholars discuss uh, Buddhism or not. Uh, King Ashoka was a person who uh, supported Buddhism and tried to govern his uh, empire uh, with Dharma. So he built many Buddha, Buddha st uh, Buddha's stupas and also he sent many people f outside of India. He uh, sent one of his brothers became a Buddhist monk, and that that his he sent that brother uh, to Sri Lanka. That was the first uh, transmission of Buddhism to Sri Lanka, and from Sri Lanka it went to uh, South Southeast Asia, Asian countries such as Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, or Laos. And also, uh, King Ashoka sent Buddhist monks to the west, to uh, maybe Rome and also Alexandria. So since the time of King Ashoka, Buddhism uh, was introduced outside India. And some scholars discuss, you know, uh, in Christian Bible, New Testament, New Testament, there's some influence from Buddhism. Uh, for example, the story of a uh, lost son returned to the, his father. Uh, very similar story appeared in the Lotus Sutra also. So there are some similarity. So uh, I think it must be true that there are a lot of communications more than we can we imagine today. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, that, this is what Uchamuro is saying here, but I am not sure exactly what kind of influence uh, Buddhism received from European way of thinking uh, to create Mahayana Buddhist teaching. That is what we are not sure. But there, it's true that there are many, you know, influences each other. And, you know, there is a, a Buddhist uh, sutra uh, that is a record of conversation between Greek king and Indian Buddhist monk. The name of the sutra is a question of king uh, in Japanese, Mirinda. Mirinda is a Japanese pronunciation of that king. But I think uh, original Sanskrit word is Menandros. King Menandros asked a question to Buddhist monks whose name was Nagasena. And that's I, I'm not sure if there is an English translation of that sutra or not, but the uh, questions from Greek king to Buddhist monks are kind of interesting. They discuss about, of course, uh, uh, egolessness or no soul, teaching of no soul. And king asked, if there's no soul or no uh, Atman or no self, then who I am and who I was yesterday are different. 
So, should I take responsibility for what I did yesterday or not? That kind of, you know, conversation. So there are some, you know, uh, philosophical influence sh should be, you know, taken place together. I mean, each side, I think. Anyway, now he introduced what are the four seals, page seven. <coughs> The first seal is that all phenomena are impermanent. Well, in Japanese, shogyo mujō. The second is that everything is suffering. Wasangai kaiku. The third, so the order is different from I, from mine, and uh, this is more traditional. This is made, made up by me. I'm, I changed the order. I'm sorry. If it's, me, it's a mistake, <laughs> that's my mistake. Uh, the third is shoho muga, or sometimes grossed as all things and events, all dharmas, being without self. Maybe it would be clearer to say that things have no substantial independent existence of their own. You know, this is what the, uh, the Heart Sutra says, you know, when it says, uh, Avalokiteshvara uh, sees only five skandhas, nothing else. And uh, he sees those five skandhas are empty as its own nature or self-nature. That means there's no fixed self-nature. That means, means it can, uh, you know, arise, stay for a while, changing and perish, go away. Because there's no fixed self-nature. It can change. So, egolessness or no self and impermanence are together. That, that is why I put two impermanence second and egolessness third. And I think, I said, as I said yesterday, this is the basic reality. Uh, Uchamura said all these four are. Uh, absolute reality or truth, but I'm not sure about that. Maybe I'm, I have my opinion is different from Uchamaros. I mean, I think the second and third, impermanence and egolessness, are absolute truth, but first and fourth is the way we live, whether we uh, awaken to this, this reality or not. Our life becomes suffering, or our life becomes nirvana. So I'm not sure, you know, fast and force are absolute reality or not. So I'm not sure means I, I, I don't say I'm right. <laughs> so uh, please think by yourself. But anyway, this is my understanding. Uh, so, uh, and fourth, the fourth seal is that nirvana is tranquility or acquiescence, nehan jaku jo. In Mahayana Buddhism, the expression shoho jisso, all things are themselves ultimate reality or all things are as they are, is also used for this point, meaning that everything is truth in itself. These four uh, succinct principles are unique to Buddhism. Uh, Uchamroshi is saying, 
you know, uh, what is the word? Nehan, uh, shoho jisso. And this is not really in entire Mahayana Buddhism, but this is said by only one particular uh, master, Chinese master, whose name was uh, Chigi in Japanese. Uh, I think Chinese pronunciation was Chi Yi, uh, who was a, a founder of uh, Tendai teachings. Tendai or Tian Tai Buddhism. That is a Buddhist, one of the Buddhist schools founded in China. And that was transmitted to Japan. Uh, and uh, Dogen was originally became a monk in this tradition. So for Dogen Zenji, Chigi's teaching is kind of important. And uh, the basis of Tendai teaching uh, is uh, the Lotus Sutra. Uh, Lot, uh, Lotus Sutra in Japanese is Myoho Renge Kyo, and that means uh, in Sanskrit, Saddharma Pundarika Sutra. Saddharma means true Dharma or wondrous Dharma, and Pundarika is Lotus. So here in this title of the Sutra, this Lotus is used as a symbol or a metaphor of Dharma. Wanderous Dharma or true Dharma. Because, you know, lotus, uh, uh, you know, come out of the muddy water and bloom and yet bloom beautiful flower, which is not defiled by the mud. That is a symbol of Dharma. You know, it's uh, grow from you know, three poisonous mind, and yet it can be really beautiful. And another reason, you know, the lotus is used as a metaphor of this dharma is within the flower, the seed is already there. That is another uh, point of the lotus flower. That means that support you know, Dogen's teaching, practice, and enlightenment are one. Anyway, uh, in this Lotus Sutra, uh, especially the second chapter of the Lotus Sutra, the title of the uh, chapter is uh, Skillful Means, or Upaya, or Tactful Means. Well, it said, uh, all Buddhas came to this country, not came, but appeared in this world for the sake of only one thing, and that one thing is to uh, show or teach uh, the truth of all beings to all, to the all living beings. This truth of all being or reality of all beings is shoho uh, jisso, the true form of all beings. Sho uh, ho jisso. This is one of the most important uh, concept uh, in the Lotus Sutra. And Lotus Sutra said, uh, only, please, uh, reason why all Buddhas appeared in this world is to show this reality of all beings, true form of all beings to uh, to us and to uh, allow us to see it and uh, 
uh, awaken to it and uh, kaiji and realize it and uh, live based on that reality. So, and Dogen Zenji uh, wrote a chapter of Shobo Genzo entitled Shoho Jisso. And I'm going to uh, give lectures on Shoho Jisso uh, at the next uh, Genzo at San Francisco Zen Center uh, next January. So now I'm studying this Shoho Jisso. But uh, according to this uh, Master Chigi, Tendai Master Chigi, he said, uh, this Shoho Jisso, the true form of all beings, how all beings really are, is, uh, is not is, or contains, or includes those all four points in Dharma series. So in, he said, instead of you know, four Dharma series, he said, in Mahayana, only one Dharma series, that is Shoho Jisso, is enough. That is what Uchamuro is saying here. So it's not a matter, you know, sometimes Shoho Jisso is used instead of the fourth truth. Anyway, these are the four Dharma seals. And Dogen, not Dogen, but Uchiyamaro start to discuss uh, about each of those four seals. Next sentence, next, next paragraph. Impermanence, or shogyo mujo, means that Every living thing dies. You know, impermanence uh, actually means we need to die. We must die without any exception. Uh, of course, not only us, not only living beings, but non-living beings, everything are impermanent. But uh, this is Uchamuroshi's point. You know, we should take these teachings, this you know, absolute reality ab about me, about myself. It's not uh, some object objective reality or truth. Uh, but uh, if we apply this truth to our own life, this means we have to die. So, in other words, everything that has life loses life. Moreover, no one, least of all the living being itself, knows exactly when its life will end. Life has a limit, and it is always in a state of uncertainty. It's very, it's 100% sure we are going to die, but no one knows who, when we die. So there's uncertainty, maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe 10 years later, maybe 30 years later, but maybe today we may die. So we don't know, but we are sure we'll die. This is the actual meaning of this uh, absolute truth of imp impermanence to us. You know, this is the first undeniable reality of our life. Next paragraph. I have mentioned that many people think that simply pursuing material happiness or riches is most important in life. But stand 
that way of life next to the reality of death, and it completely falls apart. When a person who thinks he is happy because of his material situation has to face uh, death, he is likely to fall into the depths of bitterness and despair. If happiness means having plenty of money and good health, then by that very definition, you are only going to hit rock bottom when it's your time to die. When you are faced with death, what good is being healthy or wealthy? That is why all of these materialistic pursuits only end in despair in the face of the undeniable reality of death. Uh, in the previous section, he introduced three or four uh, a kind of uh, types of approach towards life. And first type is uh, you know, to many people, or a majority of people uh, seeking happiness in a materialistic way. Uh, and uh, this, uh, what uh, Uchamroshi is saying in this paragraph, is because of the undeniable reality of impermanence, this way of life doesn't make sense. You know, because, you know, we work hard to, you know, make a success in this world or society, and we achieve if we are successful, we achieve, you know, uh, some wealth or fame or other things, or status or all other things, and we can be happy like uh, heavenly beings in the six realms. But sooner or later, when uh, we have to die, we have to leave everything we achieved, we have achieved behind, and we, we cannot take anything with us to the next life. So that means when we die, we lose everything we, we attained or we achieved. So, you know, if we think the uh, purpose or goal of our life is to uh, make achievement in that way, then uh, sooner or later when we have to die, we lose all the achievement and all the possessions. So, you know, we feel why we have to, we, I have, you know, working so hard to achieve such things which we cannot, we have to lose. I think this is really a kind of a fear for all human beings, especially for people who were successful in their uh, lives. You know, when we see the ancient uh, uh, ruins of ancient uh, civilizations, you know, many of them are the huge grave of kings or emperors, you know, the pyramids in Egypt, or, you know, there are many of those things. In Japan, there are the world largest grave of the emperor. But, you know, those graves, I think, is a kind of a 
expression of those kings or emperors fear to lose everything when they die. You know, they had everything, power, wealth, everything they desired, they, you know, achieved and possessed. But when they have to die, they lose everything. And I think uh, because they want to take all those things to the next life or to the uh, world of dead, they built such a huge, I think, uh, grave. So I think those, you know, uh, great, huge graves of the uh, ancient emperors is a kind of a symbol of fear of, you know, uh, I, mean, I think fear against this reality of impermanence. We have to die and we cannot take anything we have now. So uh, from this, you know, uh, very simple uh, reality, we cannot negate, no one can negate this way of life to, you know, seek material happiness or success cannot be the true way of life. You know, that is why he said the first type of approach to our life that uh, really work or make sense. But most of most of human beings living in that way. I think that is a problem for not not only for this modern times, but for all living beings, not living beings, but all human beings. You know, this is a very basic problem. So we need to find another way of life. And uh, in the previous section, he introduced two other attitudes, two types, two other types. One is, uh, second one is uh, uh, looking for some absolute to be the authority for our life, like a God, and to uh, live for the sake of the God, or some absolute authority. And uh, third at types is uh, is to search for some sort of permanent philosophical truth. So there are three types according to Jamrosh. And and in this section, when he discusses about four seals, he is saying basically he's saying those, all of those three types doesn't work at least to him. And he introduced uh, Buddhist uh, teaching or Buddhist practice as a kind of alternative. Uh, here we are. Uh, page 8. What exactly is it that we have to learn from this first undeniable reality. We have to clarify what life and death really are. We have to know clearly just what it means to be alive and what it means to die. In Pure Land Buddhism, there is an expression uh, gosho o negau, that is, have hope for the next life. The belief is that life opens up after death. But that's not a very good understanding of the expression. What gosho or after life refers to is the life that arises when one clarifies this matter of death. It means knowing clearly 
just what death is, and then really living out one's life. That is the most important thing we can learn from the first undeniable reality that is impermanence. Uh, so from this very simple and undeniable reality, which Amaro said we have we have to learn, you know, that to clarify what is life and what is death is most important. And this is what uh, Dogen said in Shobo Genzo Shoji or Life and Death. Uh, usually, life and death is a kind of a expression that refers to transmigration within sansara or six realms of sansara, life after life. You know, uh, we live and make certain karma, and depending upon what karma we make, we'll be born uh, next life in certain realms. You know, this uh, endless, you know, transmigration is called a chain or cycle, cycle of life and death. So life and death, as a Buddhist term or expression, uh, is not positive. It has negative connotation. The endless... Uh, transmigration within sansara is called life and death. But in Shobo Genzo, uh, life and death, or Shoji, he said, uh, to clarify life and death is most essential thing for all Buddhists. And he said, uh, if we cling to life and death, we lose, I'm before that, he said, uh, life and death is uh, how can I say? It's really it's kind of difficult. His Japanese expression is Shoji wa hotoke no on inochi nari. Shoji wa hotoke no on inochi nari. And Shoji is life and death. Uh, Hotoke is Buddha. And Inochi is life. So basically, literally, he said, life and death is Buddha's life. And this own. Uh, is same as O, that makes uh, this thing, this is a way, a polite way to uh, call this thing, this inochi. So this inochi or life is precious thing. You know, we, in Japan, we uh, put this word on or O to almost everything. Uh, you know, for example, mizu is water in Japanese, but we call this omizu instead of mizu. This is a kind of polite, polite, uh, polite way to say what this is. And, uh, you know, Rice is kome in Japanese, but we say okome. 
so we you know put this all or own to almost everything to kind of uh, express our appreciation or gratitude to almost everything that support our life so he said you know this life and death as a common as a common meaning this is negative thing sansara but he said life and death is buddha's how do you translate this life with all own how can we express our gratitude and appreciation of this life it's very difficult to translate some translation uh, make this L R as a capital capital L life so life and death is Buddha's capital L life that means this you know our life and our death within this uh, transmigration actually is Buddha's life that means, and Dogen continued therefore you know we should not cling to life and death if we cling to life and death we lose Buddha's life and yet if we hate life and death or if we dislike life and death we also lose Buddha's life That is how, uh, according to Dogen, that is how we study or clarify life and death. Life and death is neither uh, something we should cling to or attach ourselves, uh, nor we should dislike or hate. But life and death, we accept this life and death as Buddha's life. And uh, this Japanese expression from Pure Land Buddhism, Dogen is, I'm not Dogen, I'm sorry, Uchiyamurashi is talking is uh, Gosho. is life and this expre- expression go show or negau means hope or wish for the afterlife means uh, or refer to very basic teaching of pure land Buddhism that is uh, pure land Buddhist especially in Japanese pure land Buddhist uh, is a little different from Chinese Pure Land Buddhist. Uh, especially the founder of uh, one of the pure, uh, schools of Pure Land Buddhism in Japan named Jodo Shinshu, uh, whose name was Shinran. <coughs> uh, anyway, the basic teaching of Pure Land Buddhism is uh, Shindan and other Buddhist, uh, Pure Land Buddhist teachers said, this world is too bad to gener- degenerate. So, uh, because, you know, it's far from Buddha's time and uh, our world is getting worse. So, uh, after 100 years or, or 1500 years after Buddha's death, uh, only teaching remains. Uh, no one pra- actually practice, and no one attain enlightenment in this world. So there's no hope to be enlightened or to be liberated from evil karma in this life. No practice doesn't work. 
So, uh, and yet there is, there is a Buddha whose name was Amitabha. When he was a Bodhisattva, he made a, he made 48 vows. And one of his 48 vows is, uh, when I became a Buddha, I invite all living beings to my Buddha land. And if it's not true, I will not become Buddha. And this Bodhisattva has been already become Buddha. That means all those 48 vows are already accomplished, completed. So therefore, if we wish, well, if we have faith in this Amitabha Buddha's vow and uh, take refuge in this Buddha, then uh, we have no hope to become enlightened in this world, but we can, we can be born in the Amitabha Buddha's pure land. Uh, then there is much better than this world, so we can practice in Buddha land or pure land, and we can, you know, attain enlightenment there. That is what this Gosho means. You know, we have no hope in this lifetime. But if we have a, a pure faith in Amitabha Buddha's vow or power of salvation, then we could be born after our death in the pure land and we can practice there without difficulty. That is a very basic teaching of pure land Buddhism. Uh, but Uchamuro uh, is talking this uh, expression, Gosho, or afterlife, uh, especially uh, in the teaching of Shindan, the founder of Japanese Pure Land Buddhist, uh, doesn't mean, you know, we have to be born after our death here. But he said, uh, when we have a Face, to face in Amitabha's uh, vow of salvation, we are already in the pure land, not the matter of after death or next life, but we are already s uh, saved by the power of Amitabha, not by the power of our practice, our personal effort. But because of our faith in Amitabha, we are saved. So it's not so different from Christian teaching. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that is what this uh, gosho or negao means. So he, Uchamuro is discussing the common understanding of this expression. We can, we can hope to be born in the pure land and we can practice and en become enlightened there. It's not uh, true or right understanding of pure land, te pure land teaching. But we are already within the pure land when we have a pure faith in Amitabha. And what Uchamuro she want to say is uh, this teaching of Shindan that we are already in, within this lifetime, we are already in the pure. But uh, as a reality of our life, uh, based on their teachings, uh, Shindan's and Dogen's are not so different. Commonly, it said, we understand these two are opposite. One is a teaching of other power, and another is considered to be teaching of self-power. But uh, in deeper understanding, these two are not opposite and contradicted each other, but show the same reality or truth. Please. Would you just repeat the first sentence you said about what Dogen said? I'm sorry, I 
we have the new disk in. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. There's only one thing that uh, I missed. What Dogen said. What, what did I say? <laughs> oh, Dogen, uh, Dogen negate, negate the idea that we cannot attain or experience enlightenment uh, in this lifetime because this, we are living in a degenerate uh, age because our practice is itself enlightenment. I think that is what I said. Yes, okay. that, that is what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, first, uh, Dharma seal, uh, impermanence, means sooner or later we need to die. And we don't know when. That means we can, we may die even next moment. Is the reality on which we have to live. So, you know, this idea sound, maybe sound pessimistic or negative attitude or, op or observation toward life. But uh, all, you know, Buddha, Shakyamuni, Dogen, and Shinran, and Uchamuroshi is saying is, unless we really deeply see this reality, we cannot really live in a most how can, lively and vigorous way. Because if we don't see this reality and we think you know, there's some fixed uh, self and to protect this self and make this self or ego uh, strong or powerful and uh, famous or wealthy, if we live in that way, you know, the final reality we have to face at the end of our life is dying. And it's too late to see that reality when we have to, when we are aged or when we are sickness. Actually, not too late. Whenever we awaken to that reality, that is the chance or opportunity we can really face to that, you know, in Dogen's expression, Buddha's life. So it's never too late. But all those Buddhist teachers recommend, recommend or encourage us to see that reality when we are still have even some time to live based on that reality. Then we don't need to, you know, work too hard to, uh, how can I say, uh, seeking success or wealth or whatever, you know, as a kind of a, uh, as a result of attachment to our permanent ego. Then, you know, the reality that we have to die sooner or later is not something fearful. If we think to protect our ego and make our ego strong and powerful, and we live in that way entire, entire our lives, and finally we have to face that we have to lose everything, then you know, this life seems suffering, no matter how successful we are. And more often, our life is not so successful. So if we live in that way, our entire life becomes suffering. That is, uh, I mean, the meaning of the second uh, truth in the four seals, everything is suffering. So this everything suffering doesn't mean we have no joy or happiness or success, but uh, I'm going to discuss about this tomorrow, but this means 
even success, joy, or happiness is become part of suffering. You know, if we don't have those those good things, there's no suffering actually. We we may have, we can have. There's a possibility we can uh, gain those things, and yet we have to lose sooner or later. Is cause of suffering. We cannot control. We cannot, you know, uh, that life under my control. That is suffering. So suffering. When Buddha said everything is suffering, doesn't it? Doesn't mean, you know, everything we experience is suffering, or painful, or sad. Of course, we have, you know, joy, happiness, success, fortune, and we can be wealthy. And yet, if we, you know, put those uh, both condition in the uh, picture of the reality of impermanence, you know, that positive part or joyful part of our life also become part of suffering. That is, fat, you know, uh, this truth of suffering. Uh, means that is what uh, we are going to study tomorrow. Uh, now it's ten thirty-five. Any uh, question or comments? Please. Um, I was thinking that there are people in this world that are successful mm -hmm. and famous. Mm -hmm and wealthy mm -hmm. that have contributed a lot mm -hmm. to our society. Mm -hmm. Would you say that they're suffering? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's up to them. And this suffering doesn't mean really mentally or psychologically feel s suffer or not. Even, you know, they might be happy in their feeling or emotion. But that way of life, if uh, they think you know, they are happy because they are successful, because they have power and uh, wealth to help others, if their happiness and uh, uh, satisfaction is based on that uh, fact that they are successful, uh, when they really face their death, they f I think they feel something, you know, kind of uh, empty, I think. Does it make sense? Um, I guess when I think of death, I think of you can't take anything that you have with you, but what you give away you can take with you. If you, if you have such an attitude, this is not really my position, but uh -huh. we share with all beings, then it's different. Mm -hmm. That is not the reason or purpose of a life, but it's a condition the person may, may not, maybe, maybe not, you know. And if, depending upon if we think this is my position, this is mine, or this is me, then we have fear when we lose it. But if we see the reality that this is not mine, but depending because of causes and conditions, uh, as a kind of a, a temporal <laughs> condition, it belongs to me, but not really my position, so we have to share with others, then that is, the position is not the purpose of that person, person's life. So I think it's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have something to say? With the idea of impermanence and death, mm -hmm. if we truly realize that, then why try to attain anything in the way of knowledge or...? Well, Fat Dogen said, when he discussed about impermanence, when we really, really awaken to the reality, uh, what he said is, uh, 
Mm, how can I say? We find that there is no time to waste because we may die soon, sooner or later. And we cannot attach ourselves to mm. the material things or our personal success. Uh, that's why he said we practice for the sake of practice, not to attain something. So his uh, expression or teaching of just sit or just practice means not for the sake of attaining something from outside. We live moment by moment to express or manifest our life force, which is a gift from nature or from Buddha, and share with all beings, so we attain nothing. So it's not a matter of we attain, we try to attain something, but we try to use our life, not, I don't like the word use, but it manifest our life, or burn our life force uh, to share this, you know, Buddha's life with all beings, with all people. So it's a matter of moment by moment. It's not uh, uh, like uh, I make, I practice or make effort for this moment in order to attain something in the future. Of course, uh, as a common sense, we do. But uh, as actual reality, only this moment, this present moment is real reality. So we focus on what we can do right now, right here. You know, my talk, <coughs> I have to talk tomorrow again, <laughs> but my talk today is only this moment. So I try to do my best at this moment. Maybe I'm, maybe, maybe not. You know, I'm here to talk tomorrow morning. I may die tonight. You know, that kind of attitude. So uh, what I'm doing now, talking about uh, this kind of teaching, is not to attain or accomplish something, but uh, to do my best at this moment. And you know, my effort, or my effort to do my best at this moment, uh, bring about what we can, I can do tomorrow or in the future. But that is not the goal. Actually, we are all, I think we are always in the goal. And for, do our best at this moment, be mindful at this moment, moment is our goal. And we keep, we continue, you know, this way of life. But we do things, the idea is to do things mm. and to always be present. It's not, because I think that anything I do is going to make somebody else a better person, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't, I should not exist mm -hmm. for other people mm -hmm. as an example, mm -hmm. because that would be egotistical. What I should do is just be present and do what I do. I think without so. Without any kind of idea that if I do this, if I don't rob a bank, mm -hmm. then maybe somebody else won't rob a bank. Or if I wait until the traffic signal changes before I... I just do it because it's helping me, mm. or it's because it's it's a law, or it's a rule, or it's something to live by. Not because I think because it's our vow, our vow not to do harmful thing for us and for others. A vow do, or a precept. If you do it with the idea that you're doing it for someone else, is it that egotistical? Because it would make it would almost put you in a position that you know the right way. Uh, if we think I have a capability or ability to help others or to teach others, therefore I do. This is, there's a separation if we have that attitude between this person and others. And I think I'm better than those people, so I have to help those people. If we have that kind of attitude, it's egotistical and it's not a bodhisattva practice. Please. This is more on the same line, because I'm thinking this afternoon you're going to prepare tomorrow's talk. 
Now, if you actually thought you were going to die tonight, you might do something different. Um, like you might sit in or give another talk. Um, but because you think you'll be alive and we'll be here tomorrow, you'll prepare the talk. So, it, so there's this tricky thing about being in the moment and yet being in time. Yeah. And I'm so it's a, it's a kind of a you know, truth of fact or a accident or contingent. You know, I may die tomorrow mm-hmm. or today, or I may still alive tomorrow. And for now, because of the information or material information about my my condition this moment, I expect or hope or think I'll be I can give a talk tomorrow. So I make kind of a choice or decision what is the best thing to do for today. Yeah, for so some reason, I mean, this, this is a sticky point for me because I'm always... It's not sticky, but it's complicated. You know, it's a, a subtle. Yeah, because I'm in training, I'm putting a priority on being in training. Mm-hmm. But if I thought I was going to die, like in two months or something, I would like do some things. You know, because the training is oriented towards the future. So, what so. uh, the truth of impermanence uh, teaches us is, you know, we may die any time. So okay. we have to we have to make choice on that mm-hmm. reality based on that reality. So, if you think if you die in two months, you don't, you know, practice this way, then you have to make choice another choice. <laughs> It's up to you, mm. not to me. <laughs> Please. Just a quick question: Is it um, the three poisonous minds that create transmigration, or is transmigration the reality, and therefore out of that we have three poisonous minds? Or are they not related? Well. Uh, Buddhist teaching, Buddha's teaching is transmigration was caused by three poisonous mind. Yeah. You have something to say? The two ways of coming to the truth or to the absolute, Mm. uh, one is self-power, one other power. Mm. The other power is the way of faith, Amitabha. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a concentration on impermanence. So one has a way of taking away all that, that is the absolute. Is that the point that they two meet? Uh, as I said, uh, as a common understanding, these two are considered to be opposite and two different, completely different. And if one is right, another is wrong. But uh, I said uh, no, those two are not really different. And the reason why I say so is, uh, at least in Dogen Zenji's teaching, he said, when we practice, we should practice, uh, how can I say, going beyond separation between self and others. If we think, you know, we, if we separate ourselves from other beings, and I practice my, for myself with my own personal willpower and strength, then this is really <laughs> uh, self-power. But actually there's no such uh, separation between self-power and other power. Uh, both Shinran and Dogen said, even the faith we, ha- we have is the gift from Amitabha, that means from other power. So there's no such thing called self-power. And when Dogen said, uh, we practice beyond separation between self and others, that means you know, we, we cannot really practice you know, only with my 
personal willpower. We need、uh, some willpower you know, when we have to wake up at 4 30 in the morning. <laughs> You know, even though I'm tired, sleepy, and I don't want to, but somehow using my willpower, you know, stand up from the bed and come down. But that is only a <laughs> very tiny part of my practice.、Uh, but I can wake up because I'm alive. And I'm alive because there's f-、uh, food, water, air. That is much larger <laughs> part of this practice. So, there's no such, I think there's no such、uh, things called a self power. So, I think basically self power and other power are the same power.、So、I mean, that is Buddha's power or Buddha's life. Okay.、Uh, anything else? Okay, thank you very much.